Well, welcome once more uh, to our evening uh, time together. We pray the Lord will bless us as we uh, look at the scriptures and we hear the word, the, the word of God preached here at uh, the Salford Community Church. Uh, we're going to just read a, a psalm to begin with, a, a psalm that calls people to together to worship. And uh, it says, it's Psalm 134, and it says this, Behold, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary, and bless the Lord. The Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. Well, let's uh, call upon the Lord's blessing upon us now in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we praise you and thank you that we are doing something very special, uh, Lord, in, in many ways. We're coming before you and we're asking that your blessing will be upon us uh, this evening. We want to bless you, Lord, in the reading of your word and in, in prayer and in the preaching of your word, that you might have glory and honour. And we pray also, Lord, as the psalmist there reminded us, that you bless as well. And so as we gather, Lord, in our different homes, we pray that you would bless us. Bless us, Lord, our families. Uh, bless us in our own souls. Remind us again that you are a great God and the Lord Jesus Christ, our great Redeemer, our great Saviour. We pray this then in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, let's turn to the scriptures uh, this evening and we turn to uh, 2 Timothy. We've been working our way through this epistle of uh, Paul's to Timothy, 2 Timothy and chapter 2. Uh, and we're going to read from verse 15. Paul is, uh, as we uh, probably no doubt know by now, he is seeking to prepare Timothy. Uh, who's going to be the next generation of Christian leaders in the early church. And so he says uh, to Timothy, in two, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, and we read to the end of the chapter, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for this will increase to more ungodliness. And their message will spread like cancer. Hymenius and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his, and that everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honour and some for dishonour. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honour, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snares of the devil having been taken captive captive by him to do his will well may the Lord add his blessing then to that precious reading from his word now let's uh, before we come to the preaching of God's word let's Let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we come before you uh, this evening, uh, realising, O oh God, that we are engaged 
If we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're engaged in a struggle. We're engaged in a fight. A fight against the powers of evil, the powers of the devil in this world. And we praise you and thank you that in our struggles we are not alone. And we have the help of the Holy Spirit. We have your strengthening of us, your equipping of us. Uh, we thank you, Father, that uh, we who know and love the Lord Jesus are part of your church. And that your church uh, will remain strong. And, Lord, will be used for the pulling down of the very strongholds of Satan, as the Lord Jesus Christ promised us. But, Lord, in this struggle that we have, we realise that uh, we have uh, war on two fronts. Uh, Lord, we know about the struggle that is in that is within us. Uh, Lord, we praise you and thank you that our sins have been forgiven and forgotten by our Lord Jesus. His death upon the cross. Uh, but that old sinful nature of ours is still trying to disturb us and to uh, annoy us and still trying to lead us uh, with the help of the devil into uh, sinful behaviour and sinful practices. So, Father, we pray that you would help us to fight that and to resist the devil. And, uh, Lord, seek to be diligent in fleeing those, um, those sinful thoughts and sinful practices that might come uh, towards us that seem to uh, bubble up from within our hearts. We're also mindful, Lord, that we're engaged in a, in a, a struggle and a battle against the sin that is within that is that is in this world in which we live uh, a lord a, a world which is anti-god anti-christ a world which would lord want to push us in directions of uh, of self-worship and uh, the worship of anything other than you the true god and your son the true and only savior so father we pray that uh, we would fight uh, uh, against these things that we Lord that you may maintain uh, your church you preserve your church that Lord, you preserve us as those who uh, would battle uh, Lord in the life that we live against those things of evil and ungodliness but in this Lord we realize how much we need your help and so we would pray for a time of the of revival as we call it a time when God the Holy Spirit himself comes down and fills his church and fills his people and that Lord your, your, your church and your people will go out and uh, Lord proclaim the gospel the good news and that Lord you would be working in the hearts and minds uh, in the souls of uh, men and women boys and girls of even of our, our own nation Lord Lord we are such a, a low level spiritually plead and pray for the spirit to come that lord there may be such a work of grace given to this nation uh, that lord you would come down and build your church restore your church empower your church uh, but lord we we can't do this of ourselves we we plead for the help of the holy spirit in this we need him to come down and we need him to go forward uh, and Lord and to be our strength and sufficiency and so Lord uh, to that end we pray that you would as you've promised that you would build your church and Lord we pray that if your church is uh, asleep wake it up if your church is on the uh, uh, on the last pulse then Lord uh, give it life energize it Lord we pray uh, Lord we we thank you that you have promised that your church will be will be here until that time when the Lord Jesus Christ comes again and takes his people to be with him and then the church of Christ uh, will be there in heaven oh father as we uh, wait for that glorious day help us to be found as faithful servants uh, seeking to be true servants of our Lord Jesus Christ and this we pray in the precious name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, um, please.
Please turn with me uh, to 2 Timothy and to that portion that we read, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And uh, this evening we're really uh, just going to be concentrating on one verse, verse 19. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. One of the um, most popular types of uh, TV programmes, uh, I'm told, is that of the, the kind of programme that uh, deals with antiques. And I suppose the appeal of it is this, that uh, somebody has uh, got something. Uh, they Perhaps they think it's fairly worthless. It's something they, they picked up in a car boot sale, perhaps, or it's uh, something they found in the attic. And they go and see the, uh, the expert, and the expert tells them that this thing that they thought was uh, just uh, worth a few few pounds is worth hundreds of pounds. Uh, our passage uh, in 2 Timothy, and 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, well, and looking really at verses, verse 19 especially, but verse 20 and 21 also, it, it's a bit like one of those programs. Uh, we've got two items. Uh, one is common and ordinary, the other one is precious. One made of wood or clay, and the other is of silver or gold. One is uh, uh, to be kept and uh, as a prized possession, and the other one uh, may have a use but can easily be left behind, discarded. And Paul wants to, to tell us that the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is to be those precious vessels of gold and silver, and that, uh, that uh, we should be working uh, to be uh, such vessels so that we might serve our Lord. And in verse 19, I think Paul is telling us what it means uh, to be a Christian. So that's our first point. Paul telling us what it means to be a Christian. Let me read verse 19 uh, to you. Uh, he tells us there, uh, verse 19, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having the seal. Uh, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now in the previous verses, Paul has written about two people, Hymenius and Philetus. Uh, we see them recorded for us in verse 17 and then in verse 18. Hymenius and Philetus uh, seem to have been at some point teachers in the church at Ephesus, of which Timothy is the pastor. But they turned out to be false teachers. Listen to what Paul says of them. Uh, and, and their message, he says, verse 17, will spread like cancer. Hymenius and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow uh, the faith of some. So the question is, how can you tell the genuine from the false? How can you tell the genuine from the copy? Um, we're back to antiques in a way, aren't we? Because sometimes, and I remember uh, a couple of weeks ago, just seeing a back end of an antiques type program, just before the news, and uh, there was this man there, and, uh, and I think the antiques uh, expert was trying to be kind to him, and he was saying, well, this is very nice. Um, it looks very good, he said but actually it's a copy of something which was much older. And he said, well, you know, if this was the genuine thing, it would be 400, 500 pounds at least in auction. Uh, but what you've got in your hand, which you thought was precious, is worth about 10 pound. And so Paul is, is concerned uh, in verse 19 to tell us who the genuine believer is uh, how you how do you know a genuine believer and he tells us two things really in verse 19 the genuine believer has the solid foundation of God and uh, the genuine believer the Christian has the seal uh, the seal of authenticity upon him so we're going to look at those things uh, this evening so the next point is, what is the solid foundation that Paul is talking about? He says, 
Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. What's the solid foundation? Well, the foundation is Christ. The foundation is Christ. Paul uh, tells us in another place, in, one, in another letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he tells us very clearly and very specifically what that foundation is. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Well, how do you know that you have the solid foundation of Christ this morning, uh, this evening rather? It is when you see that Christ Jesus is everything to you. He is your all and all. When you see that Christ Jesus is the most precious thing to you in all the world. And we could add, I suppose, in all eternity. Now, is that true of you this evening? Is Christ precious to you? Is he the most precious thing uh, to you in your life? Or are you a little bit like uh, those two people, Hymenius and Philetus? I think the problem with Hymenius and Philetus they, it was this, they wanted to be thought of as important and they somehow managed to get themselves as, uh, uh, as teachers, as some kind of teaching ministry in the church at Ephesus and they, they wanted to be important, uh, they wanted to impress people, maybe that's why they started preaching a false, uh, false teaching because they wanted something that was different and impressive and perhaps they were wanting people uh, to look, respect them and perhaps to love them. But the Christian, the real genuine believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't want to impress people. He wants to love Jesus. He wants to love God. And he wants to serve God. Next point tells us that, uh, that for Paul... Uh, Paul is telling us that for the genuine believer in Jesus, there's a seal, a, a mark of authenticity. Let's back to 19, verse 19 again. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. And then he says, uh, the Lord knows those who are his. Well, he's talking about a seal. He's talking about a mark of authenticity that shows the genu who the genuine Christian is. As a, as a boy, uh, and you probably have heard me say this in the past, I was very involved in, in, in sea fishing and uh, I won a particular competition and I was given a cup, a silver cup. Uh, at least I thought it was silver until my dad pointed out to me that it didn't have a hallmark. Instead, it had a stamp on the bottom which said, EPNS, electroplated nickel silver. So it wasn't, it wasn't uh, silver. And it, to make me feel a bit even smaller, he told me it wasn't worth very much. But what is the the seal of the genuine believer in Jesus? And the answer is, God, the Holy Spirit, who dwells in every believer and every child of God. Let me take you to another letter of Paul's, and this time the uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and uh, to chapter 1 and verse uh, 13 and 14, where Paul speaks about uh, the being sealed and about the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and verse 14, uh, he's speaking to Christians. He speaks about how they trusted in Christ. And then in verse 13 he says, In him you also trusted, that's Jesus, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. He is dwelling in you. He is the seal, the authentic stamp, as it were, that you are a child of God. 
And, that, uh, and that's what Paul is talking of here in verse 19 when he says here about that seal. Uh, nevertheless, verse 19, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows who are his. How does the Lord know? Well, the Holy Spirit is dwelling in the Christian, but we can put it like this as well. The Lord is the maker. You know, he has made us and he has put his seal upon us. Those who belong to Jesus, those who belong to God, uh, have the stamp of the seal because he made us, he chose us, he called us, he uses us, he keeps us, preserves us until we come to glory with him. And uh, this is what Paul is saying in those verse 20 and verse 21 as well, when he talks about those vessels, some for honour and some for dishonour. Uh, the vessels that are uh, silver and gold and the vessels which are uh, of wood and of clay. Uh, the vessels of honour have the stamp of the maker on them. Uh, and if you're we are believers, true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the stamp of God upon us. God, the Holy Spirit, lives in us. But then Paul tells us something else. He tells us, in effect, that there's a second sign of authenticity that tells us whether someone is a genuine believer in Jesus or not, or whether we are a genuine child of God. And again we need to go to verse 19. There uh, Paul tells us, Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now often in these uh, antique uh, programs, uh, the experts uh, not only look for the hallmark, or perhaps they will look for the, the maker's name, which might be uh, uh, put somewhere, usually at the bottom of the, the artifact, but they also look at the quality, the, the, the glazing, if you like, the, 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 the artwork, <coughs> uh, the skill in its manufacture. And, and from such things, they can also see the genuineness of uh, the antique. And so Paul here is also telling us uh, about the qualities of the child of God uh, that prove that they are genuine Christians. So Paul is looking at these things from two different directions. First of all, there's the direction of God. The, the God knows who, uh, who are his. But then now Paul is looking at uh, the believer and how the believer can know uh, that he is a genuine Christian, a genuine uh, believer. And he's got two things to say. The first is this, that everyone who names the name of Christ. The person who names the name of Christ. Verse 19 again. Uh, Let everyone who names the name of Christ. He says. Now this is an important test of faith. And Paul brings this up uh, in some of his other epistles. Uh, for example in Romans he, he brings this up too. About uh, saying that Jesus is Lord. Now that's, this was kind of important, very important in fact, in the first century. And in the world in which Paul lived as part of the Roman Empire, because there was this uh, cult of the Caesar. It was a kind of test of loyalty. If you were a, a good uh, Roman, uh, you had to uh, make a public declaration. If, if you were, say for example, if you were in the, the city of Philippi, Philippi is the great example of this, Every year, the citizens of Philippi had to come and stand before uh, the, uh, the, the local magistrates and they had to declare, Caesar is Lord. And uh, uh, that is one of the reasons why the Christians of Philippi were under persecution and suffering, because they refused to do that. They couldn't say, Caesar is Lord, because they, want, because they knew that Christ is Lord. That's what they would say, Christ is Lord, not Caesar. And it was a test of faith, it was a test of authenticity. Now, what test of authenticity do we have today? In a way, I think it's gone full circle. I think the test of authenticity 
for the Christian today is to say, I am a Christian. Because uh, in the world in which we live today, in, in this country today, then uh, to say that you're a Christian can often be uh, the source of derision and mockery, uh, laughter. You don't really believe in all that, do you? Say the people. Uh, you might be despised, you may be looked down upon because you go to church, because you say that Jesus is your Lord. Perhaps uh, we can often be more specific and say, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came from heaven, who lived that perfect sinless life, who died on the cross for my sins, was buried and rose from the dead on the third day, and lives forever at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. Now, why do I say that is an authentic uh, sign of a genuine Christian? Well, if you go back, I suppose, 60, 70 years ago, uh, saying that you were a Christian was no big deal. Somebody might have said, oh, you're a Christian. Well, everybody's a Christian, aren't they? If you were British, if you were living in, in England, well, you're a Christian. Uh, that's what was expected. Uh, but it's not, not the same these days. To call yourself a Christian is a very big deal indeed in the very world, the very age in which we live. Because it seems to me that more and more people don't like the name Christian, don't want to be thought of as a Christian, and will rather be considered to be something else. I wonder if you've noticed something that I have over the years, that people are very reluctant to say that they believe in Jesus, the real Jesus. Instead, I get people uh, saying this to me. When they discover that I'm a pastor, that I'm a, a minister of the, of the gospel, they sometimes want to make a connection with me and they'll say something like this. Well, you know, I go to church. Or they'll say, well, you know, I, I'm a Baptist. Or I, I've got, uh, oh, my family are Methodists, they might say. But increasingly, I want to say to such people, that's great that you go to church. It's great that you've got some sort of Christian connections, but are you a real believer? Are you a real Christian who loves the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, that is what Paul is telling us. That's one thing that marks out the authentic, genuine believer. They will say, I'm a Christian. I believe in that. I believe in Jesus, the Son of God, who died on the cross, is risen from the dead, seated at the right hand, who died for me. But what is the other thing that Paul wants us to note? Well, it's there again in verse 19. He says, uh, And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Let everyone depart from iniquity. Now, Paul is telling us here, uh, in, in a way that he's using these words, uh, he's, he's, by implication, he's telling us that believers in the Lord Jesus Christ are not perfect. They are not sinless. You become a Christian, you become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, that doesn't, become, that doesn't mean you're perfect, that you're sinless, that you never do anything wrong. But rather he tells us that we have a desire, a longing, if we're to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, not to sin. So he's saying that a genuine believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, it's not a case of that you don't sin, but rather you don't want to sin. You desire not to sin. You want to depart from sin. As he tells us, let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Paul has, his, uh, has had his struggles in this area. We might say, I think, that he has his struggles in that area. 
there's a very interesting section of the New Testament. It's Romans chapter 7 and it's the second half of the chapter. And there <coughs> Paul is talking about his struggles uh, with sin. Now I think he's uh, talking about himself as a believer and uh, as a believer he has his, uh, his fights uh, with that old sinful nature within him. And it's, a, it's, it's quite a difficult passage, it's quite a difficult passage actually to translate from the Greek. Uh, but one particular verse I want to share with you, it's verse 17, Romans 7 verse, uh, sorry, Romans 7 verse 19 I should say. And Paul says this, For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice or I do. Perhaps it's better to take a perhaps more modern translation that have sort of simplified what Paul is saying and put it like this. This is from the New English Translation. He says, uh, verse 19 of Romans 7, For I do not do the good I want, but I do the very evil I do not want. And a, a genuine believer, a genuine Christian, uh, knows knows that uh, that I would suggest to you is one of the hallmarks of every true believer uh, every true believer wants to stop sinning every true believer wants to depart from sin uh, but as we struggle with that uh, in that fight with that old um, sinful nature we find still is within us and Paul in that Romans chapter 7 and we're going to have a a look uh, just a, a bit at the end of that chapter of Romans 7 Paul there in Romans 7 he he paints this picture of his struggles his uh, the problems he's got of of how sin is within him and he's warring against the well, uh, the inward man and so on like that as he calls it and then he comes to verse 24 25 the last two verses of that chapter and what does Paul say well, he comes and makes a statement. He's been talking about his struggles. And he says, Oh, wretched man that I am. That's quite a statement from Paul, isn't it? Oh, wretched man that I am. And then he says, Who will deliver me from this body of death? And he's, he's aware that in this struggle with sin, he can't, he can't deal with his own sins. He can't pay the price for his own sins. Uh, uh, but... He realizes that the answer, uh, the answer for those sins that he's struggling with, uh, and that those sins that will be dealt with and forgiven and forgotten in God, is in Christ. Because he says, "I thank God," verse twenty-five. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the Lord of God, but with the flesh, the Lord of sin. He thanks God. And then, if you want to get into the, the next chapter, chapter 8, verse 1, because remember, uh, Paul didn't write in chapters and verses, so this is all connected up. He says in verse 1 of Romans 8, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus has done it. He's paid the price. Oh, there's Paul, he's the Christian, he's struggling with sin. Uh, that that sin within him that keeps bubbling up, uh, and he's he, he he he's worked up about it. But he knows where he can get, where where his sin will be dealt with. He knows where he can get release from that sin. It's from Jesus Christ. Uh, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Let me ask you as we close this final point uh, this evening. How sensitive to sin are you in your life? How sensitive to sin are you in your life? Now Paul is very, very sensitive. We can see that of course in Romans chapter 7. But are you as sensitive to sin, that, that sin within you as he was? Does it eat you up? Uh, does the thought of the bad things that you have done wound you and hurt you? Uh, 
do you find yourself uh, uh, convicted? Uh, I shouldn't have said what I said to that person. I shouldn't have thought what I did about that person. I shouldn't have done what I did. Thoughts that come into your mind. Why did I seek revenge uh, for an evil done to me? Why have, why have I hated my heart instead of love for someone? Why was I so cowardly, cowardly and not to speak up for Jesus? Now we've all been there. We've all been where Paul has, has taken us in Romans 7. We've all felt bad over sin that has, that has popped up, bubbled up in us. And perhaps you've heard, like me, the whispers of the devil whispering into your ear. How can you be a Christian? If, you, if you've done this or you said this to someone. Well, the distinguishing mark of a genuine, authentic Christian is not that we didn't sin. Because there's only one sinless one. And that sinless one is the Lord Jesus Christ. No, the distinguishing mark is this. I didn't want to do it. I feel bad about it. I want to depart from it. In fact, I'm striving to depart from it. And I cry out to God because of it. And we come to the, the point that David, sorry, that Paul came to when he speaks of himself as a wretched man who will deliver me from this body of death. But like Paul also, we can, we can praise God. But thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus has paid the price. The authentic, genuine believer knows the struggles. He knows that he is a, a sinful man or a sinful woman. But he has a redeemer. He has Jesus, the sin bearer, who took his sins, all his sins to the cross, and paid the price for sin on that cross. So that we can say, thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, let's, uh, let's uh, close in prayer. Let's bow our heads in prayer and then a word of benediction. Let's pray. Father, we uh, come uh, before you again and we acknowledge, Lord, as we should often do, that we are not perfect people, uh, not sinless people. Uh, we seek to be faithful servants of the Lord Jesus, faithful children of yourself. Uh, we thank you for God the Holy Spirit who helps us and leads us and guides us and strengthens us in so many ways. And Lord, we want to ask your forgiveness again for the times when we stumble when we fall into into sin into temptations uh, when we are not really behaving like we should as the children of God uh, and yet Lord we want to praise you and thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ who has paid that price for all our sins there at Calvary's tree Calvary's cross but Lord help us help us Lord to, to live out our lives as genuine authentic believers in Jesus seeking to name the name of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, to the world and to uh, diligently uh, seek to depart from uh, a life of sinfulness and seek instead uh, a life of holiness and godliness that we might give you all the glory and all the honour and that you might be praised. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and forever. Amen.